Aleluya. Good night, everyone. We trust that you have had a good day. And as we have come into his house to worship him, worshiping around the, his word, trust that we will find peace, find joy, find happiness, find a place for which we can go forward in hope, knowing that he is our tomorrow. He is our life. He is our all in all. We have come into this house, gather in his name to worship. We have come into this house, gather in his name to worship him. We have come into this house, gather in his name to worship Christ, our King. Worship him. Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening another time, trusting, dearest Lord, that you will meet our every needs. As your word reminds us, where the two or the three are gathered together, touching anything concerning you, you are in our midst. We know there is God that you are here because we are more than that number and we are here there is Lord to, to touch you, to, to reach out to you. We ask there is Lord that you might open our minds, open our hearts to receive your word and that it will become a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path as we seek to give you all the honor, the praise and the glory. In Jesus name we say, Amen. Again, we want to welcome everyone into the house tonight. We trust that as we come, we will receive something from the Lord. Tonight, our study is going to be coming from the, the book of Acts. It will be a beginning study, um, and I trust that as we look into the Word, we will begin to see ourselves, we'll begin to see our church, we'll be see, begin to see the mission to which God has called us. So let me take this time to welcome everyone on behalf of our senior pastor in his absence. We trust that we will seek to find peace with God. On behalf of our CEO, we trust that as we come together, we will truly know whom to know is life eternal. Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 1 to verse 7, reading from the New King James Version. The former account I made, O Theophilus, and all that Jesus began to both to do and to teach until the day he, in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandment to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also present himself alive after his suffering, and by many infallible proof, being seen by them 
during 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Lord, which the Father had put in his authority. When we think of the the church and the church age, when we think of the movement of the church throughout the, the years, truly our minds go back to the book of Acts. And so when we look at the book of Acts, there are certain things that we need to kind of look to. So before I kind of go into the verses, verses 1 to 7, just want to do an overview of the, the book of Acts because we will be doing some other studies here and there in the book of Acts. Um, part one of Acts seems to cover chapters 1 to chapter 12. And this is where the church began in the Jewish world. And the leader for that was Peter, Simon Peter. And then in part two, we find church in the Gentile world chapters 13 to chapter 28, covering that ministry was the Apostle Paul. And so when we look at the beginning of the church, we want to kind of look at the book of Acts from the standpoint that the book of Acts, or sometimes it's called the Acts of the Apostles begin where the Gospel of Luke left off. And, and so we find that before Jesus ascending into heaven, Jesus commissioned his disciples to be his witness from Jerusalem to the end of the earth. So in fulfilling this commandment, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, the church expanded. That's where the church began. Acts shows that it, what it means to be a part of Jesus' mission. Not only be a part of the mission to the world, but the apostles set examples of what it meant to be fully devoted to Christ and to be enveloped by the Holy Spirit. And we will look at some of those situations where um, these apostles, when they began, and they started out in Jerusalem and expand to the uttermost part of the, the world, we'll see how their devotion led many to their debt. And it was because of the power of the Holy Spirit. According to the early church tradition, the author of the book of Acts is Luke, the physician. We cannot get that from his writing, who was a traveling companion with 
Paul. The Gospel of Luke also describes him as this makes Acts his second volume because he says, as he wrote to Theophilus, um, he says to this is the former a former treaty I wrote to you, and when we look at um, Luke, we find him writing to Theophilus in that book. And so we find it's also fitting to say that Luke was the author of this book of Acts. Like the Gospel of Luke, the book of Acts addressed Theophilus, who we might have provided some financial support for, for Luke in, in writing both books. We are not sure exactly, but he was a brother in Christ. Um, and since uh, the narrative of Acts end with Paul's captivity in Rome, it might have been written uh, shortly after his arrival. It might have been written somewhere in the midst um, 60 ADs. We're not quite sure, but it was written somewhere around that time because um, Paul was crucified or Paul was, was killed somewhere in 64 AD. As far as the structure of the book is concerned, the book follows an outer expansion of the gospel, which spreads from Jerusalem to Judea and to the end of the earth. Geographically, the framework takes shape uh, in its first section, chapter 1 to chapter 8, in which it sets its foundation in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached to a crowd of Jews from all over the world, there he preaches first message to um, a number of people from a number of different language, um, from a different tribes, but they were brought to salvation through the power of the Holy Spirit. The first major expansion comes in Acts chapter 8 when the apostle taking the gospel to the parts of Judea and Samaria. And then in chapter 13, we find another expansion where Paul launches his first missionary journey. And we will look at some of that some in, sometimes in the future when we look at the journeys that Paul is first, second, and third missionary journey. Geographically, the framework of Acts expands from Jewish missions. So it starts out in the Jewish world, but it ends up with spreading the gospel to the Gentile mission. We know that the, in the Jews, among the Jews, the, Peter was the head of the Jewish mission. He was the one who was there teaching and preaching. And then, of course, we find in, in, in Acts chapter 12 um, and onward, Paul was the leader to the non-Jewish mission. The book of Acts covers four broad themes, four broad outlines. Um, the church in Jerusalem, chapters 1 to chapter 8, the church in Judea and Samaria, uh, and we will look at how the, the, the 
miracles and, the, and those things expand in those regions. Paul's mission to the Gentiles, chapter 13 to chapter 21. Paul in Jerusalem and finally Paul in, in Rome. Some of the things that happen in the book of Acts is quite um, unsettling. For instance, we have a complete unexpected reversal of um, what happened to on the day of Pentecost. Because on the day of Pentecost, we find that when the Spirit of God came, every man heard them speak in their own language. And it wasn't a tongue that people didn't understand. It was understandable tongue because it says that every man heard them speak in their own tongue. And because there was so, so much clarity in the, in, the, in the language that they understood the good news of salvation, there were 3,000 souls that came to Christ that day. But when we look at Genesis chapter 11, we find a complete reversal of what took place on, at Pentecost. Because at the, the Tower of Babel, it where the language was confusing. I mean, people were, were, were asking for one item, but bringing another, and so the, the language was confusing. Um, so this is the Acts of the Apostle presents itself in a unified position whereby it wasn't a confusing language. It was a language was, with clarity. It was a language whereby people heard the good news of salvation in their own tongue. When we look at um, Saul, Saul a Pharisee, a persecutor of the church, we find that Saul which was converted, now become, became an apostle. He was sent to um, persecute the church. He was sent to bring people into, um, into bondage. But now he was preaching freedom. He was preaching the good news of salvation, a complete reversal of thought in the life of the apostle Paul. And then it, for the Gentiles, they saw themselves as outcasts. They saw themselves as um, not wanting, not supposed to be part of the, 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 the teaching of God, of God's people. But we find in, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 45, where, and those of the circumcision, who believed were astonished, as many as came to Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So, whereas it seems as if the salvation was just for the Jews, now it is also poured out in the life of the, the Gentiles, a complete reversal. And then in chapter 11, verse 18, Acts 11, verse 18, when they had heard these things, they were silent, and they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted to the Gentile repentance to life. So again, we find the, the book of Acts covers a number of these situations whereby it reverses the unexpected. Another theme that seems to be in the book of Acts um, is a, depict the rap, rapid outward movement of the gospel. And again, when the Spirit of God came 
and indwell the apostles, they took some time in Jerusalem, but they had to move out from Jerusalem <coughs> to the other um, parts of the world to form to people from incredible array of races, language, uh, social ranks, and religious background. They, it, it's no end to which the gospel begin to flow. And so when we look at um, the, 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 the message of the gospel in the book of Acts, it was spreading rapidly throughout the then known world. Acts demonstrates that Jesus is a culmination of world's history. He came to bring life and to bring freedom. This is what the world actually needs. We wonder what is happening in the world today. The world is, as one song says, gone mad. But there is nothing wrong with the world. It's a people that is in the world that makes it look like what it is. You can't turn the, the news on and don't hear um, atrocities all over. We know that if you were born, you would die, but the way people are dying, it seems very uncommon. Also, another theme that is prevailing in the book of Acts is instead of providing full details of account of the early church expansion and leadership, Acts focuses on specific movements. So you'll find Acts talks about specific movements showing a with, in broad strokes, the gospel's rapid expansion. So we know that um, uh, in, in, in Samaria, there was those who were being saved and, and being um, taught by Philip. And then Philip was taken by the Spirit into the desert to meet an um, Ethiopian um, who was coming back, reading the scripture. And, and, and so we find that the, the, the gospel is spreading, is this expanding for, from specific movements. Acts is also meant to inspire us to be part of God's work. And so when we read the book of Acts, when we study the book of Acts, we should not just study it as history. We should not just study it as things in the past, but we will seek to become part of what was taking place, and now we are in the time when we are taking the gospel forward. So the work began, the, the work of beginning the gospel to the end of the, the earth is far from finished. It's far from finish, as God provides today, we are called to continue the effort of taking the salvation to the world. And so tonight as we look at the first seven verses, we know that the church was established in Jerusalem we know that the church expanded to Samaria and the conversion of Cornelius, and it, it's involved um, the church in Antioch, and we know the, the persecution of the church, and then the church into the Gentile world where we find Paul taking the gospel to the Gentile world to his first missionary journey, his second missionary journey, and his third missionary journey. And 
on those journey, he was able to write um, books like Galatians and Romans and Thessalonians. He wrote those books during his missionary journey. We talk about his arrest, his defense, and so we find him in different situation. But when we look at the verse, seven verses where the church began, we find that Luke writes the former account, the former account or the first account, that is the gospel of Luke. He began an account of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. All that Jesus began to do and to teach. And we will find in, um, in Acts, we will see some of those miracles taking place. But we find in Luke chapter 5, where there's this large amount of fish that was caught. It is part of the miracles that Jesus did. He healed many diseases. And Luke 4, um, 41, 42 talks about um, healing. It says that, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various disease brought them to him, and he laid his hand on them, and every one of them, and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. When I read this, I, I believe I must, I must have read this before, but when I was preparing and I read it again, I realized that the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life has dominion over demons and devils. And so if we are covered, if we are in, in enveloped with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, that gives us authority to go, to teach, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just to pray for the sick, not just to pray for those who are going through um, difficult situation, but to know that demons, demons are subject to us because we have the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 6, now it happened on the Sabbath day also that he entered the synagogue, synagogue and taught. A man was there whose right hand was withered. So again, we find that Jesus was teaching and preaching and healing. So the scribes and Pharisees watch him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. And how we see that is happening today, that the, the world is watching us, what we do, watching us, what we say to find a, an accusation against us. But he knew their thoughts. <clears throat> he knew their thoughts. The presence of the Holy Spirit helps us to discern what is happening. It might not always fully describe the situation, but God will help us 
to be observant, to be, um, to know what is happening around us. And so he said to the man who had a withered hand, arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said unto him, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good, to do evil, to save life or to destroy? And when he had took, looked around at all of them, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. So we find that Jesus was healing. And we know when we look at the book of Acts, we will see some of those healing taking place likewise. In Luke chapter 5, verse 12 to 14, and it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and he fell on his face imploring him saying, Lord, if you will, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So again, when the Spirit of God is over you, even those who needs help will come to cry unto you for help. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he charged him to tell no man, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them just as Moses command. So we find Jesus in the, in, in, in the book of Luke did all of these miracles. Um, he cleansed the leper, he healed the sick, and he also raised the dead. Luke chapter seven, we find him raising the dead son of this woman who was um, he was being carried out to be buried and the mother says the only son of his mother and she was a widow and a large crowd from the city was with her when the Lord saw her and had compassion on her and said unto her, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. And he says, young man, I say unto you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak and he presented him to his mother. So we find that Jesus in the book of Luke, Luke was, wrote acts about the things that Jesus did, that he began to do. And these are some of the things that Jesus did. Even nature, was subject to him. In Luke chapter 8, verses 22, the wind and the waves obey him. Not only was he subject, the nature was subject to him, but he fed 5,000 people. Luke chapter 9, verses 11 to 17. But when the multitude knew it, 
they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who need of healing. When they had begun to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, send the multitude away that they may go into their surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provision for we are in a desert place here. So even a dry place, even a place where there is no, it seems as if there is no hope, God through Jesus Christ came through. But he said to them, you give them something to eat and they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there was more, about 5,000 men. Which means, by calculation, uh, it would be about one to four in terms of women, men and women, are one to five, or probably even more. So, 5,000 men. Whether or not the men was considered to be generically men or actual men, when I say actual men, male, okay? But you know, because sometimes the Bible talks about men, it's referring to both male and female. And so whether or not this was a, one of those situations that is referring to male and female, we're not certain. But God used five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000. So again, we find in the first account that Luke wrote, he wrote all of these things that Jesus began to do and to teach. So by virtue of this first account, this implies that the Paul is... Sorry, Luke is going to find that this implies that the, the second writing was just to discuss what Jesus would continue to do and teach. And so in, in, in Acts chapter 6, 3 and verse 6, we find, then Peter said, silver and gold. Again, we talk about, and we will look at these in, in a, at another time, but, but just so to mention the fact that after the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples, they were empowered to do those things which Jesus began to do. So on this situation, um, Peter said unto this man who was a beggar by the gate, he said, silver and gold have I, I do not have. But what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So we find then that the, the disciples were doing the healing that Jesus began to do back in Luke. And then in chapter 4, verse 10, let it be known unto all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stand here before you whole. So this crippled man who was uh, healed, he is saying that he's here because the same Jesus you crucified, same Jesus you buried, same Jesus is, is, is upon his authority, that this healing is taking place. Thus Jesus was the central figure, the central 
figure of each of the book of Acts as well as the book of Luke. Luke wrote those books centering on those situations where Jesus began to do and teach. I made mention earlier of um, Theophilus, a Greek name which means friend of God. He was the, the one who Paul wrote to. Theophilus came um, may be a, a specific person, um, maybe a benefactor of, of Luke, um, but regardless of the intent, God was using this Theophilus to do a special work, and Paul, Luke was, was able to make mention of him in his writing. And again, uh, as his name means friend of God, he could, Luke could be writing to those of us who are friend of God in this situation. So we are not just looking at the, the book of Luke as a book written to Luke, to Theophilus, but it's also written, is writing to all of us who love God. So Jesus began both to do and to teach those things which Luke records in the Gospel of Luke until the day, until the day where the Gospel says until the day in which he was taken up. Jesus earthly ministry began his birth through crucifixion. And we are just coming out of the Easter, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and we heard so much messages about the Good Friday, the resurrection. But, but we are here just to look at um, the ending of his ministry and his ascension. In Luke chapter 24, verses 50 to 53. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And he lifted up his, his hand and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried into, up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. So we find that the Jesus came until the day he departed, his birth, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, finally his ascension, he was taken up from his disciples. His, his, his life was filled with miracles and healing and raising of the dead and turning water into wine and feeding thousands. But at, at that point, he left two command. Two command he left with them. Remain in Jerusalem until and go into all the world and witness. So the instruction here is, might seem contradiction, contradictory, whereby he's saying to remain, but then he's saying to go. But you need to remain until you are endued with power from above. You are to wait on God. And so 
we shouldn't be running ahead of God. We shouldn't be hastening our steps to go to do God's bidding without first of all waiting on him. And then when we have been endued with the power, we go believing in Jesus. His post-resurrection ministry takes us to the point where he, he was he appeared to his disciples in flesh and blood. May he presented himself alive after his suffering. So after his death, after his scourging, after everything that was done to him on Friday, he appeared to them alive. And Luke emphasized the reality of Jesus' physically physical bodily resurrection. And if he had not raised, what good would be our teaching or preaching? What good would it be if he was not raised? The resurrection and its implication then become the heart of the gospel, the apostle's message to the world. Acts 2, verse 24. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pain of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So again, we find that the, the apostles were preaching the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. In verse 32, this Jesus, God raised up, which we are all witness. And we know that he, we will look at some of the, the meeting place that he met with his disciples after his resurrection. Acts 3, verse 15, and kill the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witness. So the, the apostles preach knowing that Jesus rose from the dead. They saw him, and we will look at some of those um, a little bit from now. They saw him, and they... And they were assured that this same Jesus is alive, and they were willing to put their lives on the line for it. So the proof that Jesus rose from the dead in a, in a physical way, um, he appeared, uh, proof of his resurrection from the dead, he appeared to the 11 in, in Acts chapter 1, verses 20 to 26. For it is written in the book of Psalm, let his dwelling be place, dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. Um, verse 21, therefore of these men whom had accompanied all the times that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, and that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us at, of his resurrection. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. They, it was the time when they were casting lots to replace Judas, who, was, um, who had killed himself, um, and so he appeared to the 11 um, in Galilee when they were by the shore trying to catch fish. Um, and Jesus said to them they should cast their net on the 
right hand side, they caught fish. And of course, we know um, Peter was so uh, impetuous, he jumped out of the, the boat, you know, just to, to get on shore. And Jesus said to them, Come and dine. He had already fish and bread for them on the shore. He met with the women in, in, in Matthew 28, 1 to 6, in Mark um, 16, 1 to 7. We find him meeting with the, the women. Um, and then the two men on Emmaus Road in Luke chapter 24. Verses 13 to 35, we find that the, the men of Emmaus, they were walking back home from the, 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 the mission in, in Jerusalem, and Jesus joined them on the journey, having a conversation with them. And when Jesus broke bread, they invited him to have bread with him. When he broke bread with them, their eyes were open. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us? And so we find that Jesus had these appearances. He appeared um, to Peter um, on the, the, the Mount of, of, of in Galilee, um, where Jesus um, announced and appeared to his, his, the 11 disciples. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. We know that they are going to be the doubters. Um, his last appearance to them was when he was ascended into heaven, um, when he met with them in, in Galilee. So, after his resurrection, the 40 days after his resurrection, um, and, and some, some people think that, you know, th those 40 days was comparable to Moses' 40 days in, in, in the mountain with God. Um, but Jesus, in those 40 days, addressed the his disciples, and the word of God says he opened their understanding to the interpretation of Scripture. He opened their understanding to the Scriptures. Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27. O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophet had spoken, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and to beginning and beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them all the scripture of the things concerning himself. So we find that after his um, resurrection, those 40 days was spent with the disciples, teaching them, guiding them, opening their understanding to the truth of God's word. He provided the basis for the apost apostolic interpretation in Isaiah chapter 54, verses 17, 11 to 17. O ye afflicted one, Tossed with tempest and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stone with colorful gems and lay your foundation with sapphire. I will make your pinnacles as ru of rubies and your gates of crystal. Um, so here we find the, the Isaiah is writing about the, the revelation of. Uh, Jesus, um, that he will become the, the chief. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. Great peace, great peace of your children in righteousness he shall establish. He shall be far more oppressive 
for you shall not fear. So we find that Isaiah was writing, illustrating that the scripture must be fulfilled. And then we find in John chapter 6, verse 44 to 47, no man come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him. So I find, we find that the, the John is writing that um, Jesus is saying no man would come to him unless the Spirit of God draw that person. Finally, we come down to the kingdom of God. Um, and, and here we find in, in verse, verse 6 that the The disciples or the apostles ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? The question that they ask really um, understood because the, the scripture talks about the kingdom of God. When the fulfillment of the kingdom of God is done, then he will set up his kingdom. And so they were understanding the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, in um, in Joel chapter two, verses. 28 to 32. And it shall come to pass, after that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see vision, and also on my men servant, on my maid servant, I will pour my spirit, and I will show wonders in heaven and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And so this was the kind of context that they were thinking that the promise of the Spirit, the outpouring of the Spirit, when the Spirit come, that God is going to take over and establish his kingdom. Jesus, in response to that question, did not rebuke them, did not say, you are out of line, you are out of order. But in verse 7, he said, it is not for you to know the time or the season which the Father has put in his own authority. And so tonight, when we look at the beginning of the church, the establishing, the start of the church, we find that there are some things that is necessary. We need to understand that the resurrected Christ did raise from the dead in a bodily and physical form. We know that he spent time with his disciples. We know that he was with the disciples and he taught them about the, the kingdom to come. And so he left them with two specific instruction. One, to wait for the promise. And two, to go and establish the kingdom of God. And so this evening... When we look at this, these first few verses of the Acts of the Apostle, we recognize that God is saying to us as a church, we need to wait in his presence. We need to wait for the outpouring of the Spirit before we can go. Um, and, and some of us might think that a missionary um, places that is overseas. But no. The missionary ground to which we are called to go might just be your neighbor. 
we can still make that impact. But when the presence of the Spirit of God is in our life, then it will enable and empower us to continue to do the things which Jesus began to do and to teach. And so tonight, it's my prayer that we will begin to understand that the church began waiting on God, waiting on the presence of God, waiting on the promise of God. The promise of God is sure. And they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So we need to wait. And after we have been endowed with the power, we need to go and to make disciples. We need to go and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We need to go and share the good news that Jesus Christ came. He walked among men. He died. He was crucified. But he rose again and is now at the right hand of our Savior, making intercession for you and for me. God bless you. In Jesus' name. And this time we're going to be taking the night's offering. And um, we're kind of opening up for Q&A. Any comment? gave the command, wait. And after you've waited and been equipped, been empowered, then we go. But I think one of the problems with um, believers today is that we want to go before we wait. And in the waiting here, I believe also it is equipped in ourselves. Yes, the Spirit of God indwell us as we are here, yes, but we need to equip ourselves in the Word of God. Equip ourselves so that we'll be able, that when we go out there, that we'll be able to, you know, just as what um, uh, the, the Apostle says, uh, when we study to, uh, to ourselves and we approve ourselves, then we'll be able to present the gospel the way that it will be effective, that the way that it will destroy the works of darkness and bring men and women to the light of Jesus Christ. But again, so that we, 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 we want to go before we wait. And we need to look back and say, okay, we need to wait. Equip ourselves. Because if the, uh, the, 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 the apostles, uh, the disciples, and if when they leave Mount Olive and went to Jerusalem, and they didn't wait as the instruction was given to them and just went out there, Peter would not be able to present the gospel to the, 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 the many groups or um, um, languages that was there when he preached that first gospel. Because we know Peter was a, a, a man that was intimidated and fearful. But after he waited and empowered and been equipped, then he could stand up firmly and declare, thus said the Lord, and this same Jesus that you crucify, God have raised him, and without him then nothing is possible then. So we, again, we got to learn to wait, and then we go. All right. Gracious Father, we thank you for the offering of your people. We ask, O oh God, that it be used for the extension of your kingdom here on earth. We ask that you might bless every giver. In Jesus' name we say, amen. And that is so true, because when you continue to look at the, the book um, and see the effects of the ministry that they had, it wasn't in themselves. It was because they waited and were empowered. Um, we will see some of the situations where... Um, they just wanted to, the shadow of Peter, 
to pass by them. They just wanted to, to, to be in, in, in a company because the presence of the Holy Spirit was present and was operating. Um, and yes, we need to wait to equip ourselves for the challenge that we are going to meet. Because de demons and devils are not afraid of flesh and blood. And so we have to have the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to, to lead us. And just in, um, secondly, you read that portion of scripture also in the um, third chapter of the book of Acts here with um, Peter and John the, um, going to the temple. And I, it, as you read it and I was just going over it here, it's fascinating because Peter looked at the, this man and said, look, you're asking for material things, money, silver and gold, but we don't even have that right here now. But, but, but look at what Peter said, that which we have, we give to you. And he said, in the name of Jesus, we must have within us that power, that name that we know, that anointing that we can impart to the world and to those who are possibly seeking for material things. And uh, we don't have that, but I, I can give you something that is better than material things and silver and gold. And this is what um, these disciples, Peter in particular, did here. He gave to the man that which they had, which he had, which is the power that is within them, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and really, the, the, the truth is that you have to have it in you to be able to give it. Because if it is not in you, you can't give it. And you can't just use words. You have to have it to give it. Yes. Good evening, Reverend. I have an observation, too. Um, and, and it's in same Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 6 here. We are um, how our expectations can lead us down the wrong path if we are not mindful to control them or to control it. Because from the time that Jesus Christ came, um, the Jews expected him to deliver them from Roman rulership. And he spent three and a half years with them, and in particular with the, the disciples. And he told them on numerous occasions that that was not his purpose. That was not his purpose because his kingdom is not of this world. And even at the last moment, when he told them to meet before he, uh, the ascension, when he told them to meet, uh, to be empowered with the Holy Ghost, they were still questioning, Lord, are you going to give us the kingdom at this time? When, in fact, he had told them several times before that that was not his purpose in coming. So, they, although that was told to them, they still had an expectation. And the expectation was wrong. The expectation was, and so often we as believers have expectations of people, of the church, of, um, of different scenarios. And when our expectation is not fulfilled, we turn around and become despondent and troubled and, and want to walk away from Jesus. So we have to be careful of that. I, and I like the way Jesus responded. He, he didn't really answer the question directly. He said to them, it is not for you to know the time. But wait until you be endured with power from above. And it's so important for us to be guided correctly, not be misguided as to or misinterpret what is being said. And so, you know, truly, it's, it's, it's one of those situations where um, we can be expecting something um, and not getting it because we are in we are in doing it wrong incorrectly um, one observation here read for me personally is um, how Luke addressed um, 
Theophilus, in Luke, almost high, Theophilus. And then in Acts 1, he addressed him as, O Theophilus. Now, my question is, don't know if you can answer it, sir, or it might not need to be answered. Was um, Theophilus um, an influential person? Um, and he wrote to him, and it seemed, though, as if the letter he wrote to him might have some impact on his life. And no, this is something going in my mind. And uh, the letter had some impact to an extent that writing to him the second time, he more or less, you know, toned that down. Maybe he became a brother at this time, so he could address him more like a brother in the faith. Now, before you know me, I would be Gloria Dyer. But now that I am a Christian, I am now Sister Dyer. So I'm basing it off of that. So I don't know if he was an influential person when he addressed him that way in Luke versus when he addressed him in Acts. Yeah, because in Luke he says, oh, excellent. And, and so um, it, it is believed that he had some thing to do with the writing of the, the Gospels, the Gospel as well as the Book of Acts. Um, he was partly influential. And again, when he says in Acts, O oh, Theophilus, it could be that he had become more familiar, more closer to him. Um, but but it's, there's nothing to prove that. But yeah, we could infer because he says, O oh, excellent, so he was recognizing his, his, his leadership at a, at, a, at a certain level. But then when he says, O oh, Theophilus, he was more a brother together, um, co-workers co together. All right. All right, if there be no other question, comment, let's all stand to... Just one more thing, yes. And those people were um, not confused in their language. They understood each other, as the scripture said. But you have to we have to understand here that what they were doing, building the tower to, to heaven, you know, if they had done that, they would have been it, taking control of the world. And God, as the creator, will not allow that. So God permitted the confusion. It's not that they were confused because they were very, very well educated. But God created the confusion for them so that they couldn't understand each other. Now, when you think about us believers or people in general, God will create scenes in our lives when we think we want to become God. Look at what happened to Lucifer. When we think we want to become God. God will create an atmosphere that put us in our place to, for us to know that he is God and not another. Uh, yeah, I understand that. But the, the, the illustration was just to show the reversal of the, the, the unity in the, in, the, in the Acts where they were speaking. Although they were speaking under the anointing of the, the Spirit, people from different places understood their language. So... Um, no, 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 no. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. If there be no other question, comment, let's all stand together as we close out tonight um, teaching. Father, we thank you for your word. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask, O oh God, that as we um, look into your word and 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 talk about your word and examine your word. We pray that you might help us to examine our hearts likewise. We ask that we might put our lives under the searchlight of your word. And so thy word will become a life lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We pray that thy word, O oh God, will indwell us and envelop us and help us, O oh Lord, to walk in a new relationship with you and so that we might be able to go Tell the world, Jesus saves, he keeps, and he satisfies. Father, we thank you for tonight. 
We ask that you might dismiss us now with your choicest blessing. And let the peace of God rest upon all of us. In Jesus' name we say, amen.